Good morning, fellow colleagues from the uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. I'm Waiki Chan, and I'm going to be hosting today's session. We have two very interesting sessions which are physiologically related and focused. And we're going to get presentations from the Biomedical Sciences um, Department plus the Physiology Department. I myself am from the Department of Anesthesiology, but because of my interest in physiology, I am going to be hosting, as I said, on this two physiologically focused topic. And before I start with the presentation with um, Dr. Bhavani, I would like all of you to understand that if you do have questions for any of these two speakers, please put it in the question and answer section so that we will address it at the end of the presentation, which is the 30 minutes later for Dr. Bhavani and at near nine o'clock for Dr. Mazia. So um, Dr. Bhavani from Biomedical is going to focus on a very interesting topic and her focus would be on this drug or on this particular ingredient called myricetin and she's going to share her um, research topic on it. Um, Dr. Bhavani, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Prof. Chan. Uh, so a very good morning to all present for today's webinar. So it's a pleasure for me uh, to share the research findings obtained in my laboratory uh, till date on this uh, compound called myricetin derivatives. So therefore, the title of my presentation today is myricetin derivatives potential adjuvant in the management of uh, diabetes mellitus and complications. So I'm from the Department of Biomedical Science, Faculty of Medicine. So the outline of the presentation uh, today, I will start off with the identification and isolation of myricetin derivatives from the plant called Sisygium malassense. In fact, this was uh, my PhD project, which uh, I started back in 2012. So I proceeded with the in vitro study on assessing the antihyperglycemic property of these derivatives. And uh, this uh, journey was continued by another PhD candidate who has also investigated the anti-diabetic uh, potentials of the derivatives using in vivo models. So she is currently waiting for her VIWA. And uh, I'll end the presentation with uh, some inputs on the ongoing research to address the challenges uh, in the project. So diabetes mellitus is defined as uh, the rise in blood sugar glucose level due to defects in insulin action and the production of insulin or both. So the disease is on the rise worldwide in which 463 million adults have been diagnosed with diabetes uh, uh, till the year 2019 based on the statistics and it is expected to hit uh, 700 million by the year of 2045. So as in Malaysia, the prevalence rate has actually reached 18.3% uh, based on statistics up to 2019. So what's the relationship between oxidative stress and hyperglycemia? When there's an increase in high blood glucose level, it will lead to the uh, increase in the production of uh, free radicals, particularly the reactive oxygen species. So when there's an imbalance between the endogenous antioxidant system, which supposedly should combat the reactive oxygen species uh, produced, it will lead to the development of oxidative stress. And this subsequently will alter various uh, related signaling pathways. As in diabetes, uh, with a prolonged condition, it actually can lead to the dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells, which reduces the production of insulin. And uh, it can also lead to the uh, incidents called insulin resistant, especially in fact, diabetes mellitus. So in which uh, tissues such as like uh, muscle, uh, liver and adipocytes will be actually uh, becomes insensitive towards insulin action. Therefore, there will be reduction in uh, the glucose uptake, and this will lead to the increase further increase in the blood glucose level. With all this um, prolonged uh, increased blood glucose level and increased oxidative stress, this will progressively lead to the development of uh, various other macro and microvascular compli diabetic complications such as uh, stroke, heart disease, renal disease, reno uh, retinopathy, and many more. So of course, uh, when it comes, let's say we take uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus in, our, um, uh, in, in the concept at the moment. So the common management is a bit through the lifestyle modification along with uh, uh, medications as well as uh, insulin therapy in some cases. So uh, with equal interest, there's also uh, growing research uh, since uh, 
for a very long time uh, on uh, to take natural products or antioxidants as an alternate approach to manage the disease. So there are many research and studies that have been conducted till date to study the effectiveness of uh, natural products in uh, managing diabetes and related complications. So um, plants uh, usually synthesizes many uh, secondary metabolites or known as the bioactive compounds mainly as their co-pigments or to actually uh, to confer the defense mechanism against UV radiation, to attract pollinators and many more. So interestingly, uh, when these plant bioactive compounds have been isolated, identified and isolated and assessed for their pharmacological effect, all these compounds have shown very good pharmacological uh, role in uh, combating certain uh, chronic diseases, including diabetes. So under the plant bioactive compounds, there are many categories. Uh, they can, can be categorized in many uh, groups. And one of the major group is polyphenolic compounds. And under polyphenolic compounds, there's a major subgroup called uh, flavonoids. And these are the uh, subgroups further under the flavonoids. So these types of uh, polyphenolic compounds have been identified to confer various health benefits, including antihyperglycemic and antioxidant properties. So with that, uh, there's a growing research on identifying potential flavonoids for the effective treatment of diabetes and related complications. I shall move now uh, the focus on Cisigem species, which has been recently identified as a potential alternate therapy uh, for diabetes. It falls under the family of Myrtaceae, and there's almost 1,200 species identified till date. And there are many fl flowering tropical plants under this uh, genus. And the highest level of diversity has been identified from Malaysia to northeastern Australia. And many of these plants have uh, proven pharmacological effects. So these are some of the examples of uh, plants under the genus of Cisigia, such as the famous black plum, clove, water apple, white apple, java apple, sea apple, and many more. So um, with, uh, when uh, the major plant bioactive components that have been identified in most of the plants under this genus are flavonoids. Uh, some of the examples are quercetin, myricetin, and various uh, derivatives of myricetin. And most importantly, the myricetin, or known as the myricetin 3OL uh, uh, rhamnocyte. In fact, it has been identified as the chemosystemic indicator of the species. So uh, the different plants under this genus have been assessed for anti-diabetic properties and many of it uh, has actually shown, many of them have shown very good uh, uh, effect, anti-diabetic effect. Uh, for example, the famous uh, Cisigium tumini, the black plum, especially the fruit, has been used as ayurvedic treatment for diabetes since the pre-insulin era and in fact has been marketed as anti-diabetic drug due to its uh, significant anti-diabetic property. Uh, similarly, other uh, plants under the genus has also shown significant antihypoglycemic property when investigated using in vitro and in vivo models, and there are many more. As in Malaysia, uh, till date, uh, so, I mean, like so far, there are two plants that have been investigated for anti-diabetic effects: so Cisigem aquum, water apple, and Cisigem polyanthum, the Indian or Indonesian bay leaf. Um, in which uh, the leaf extracts of the plant have exhibited have shown to be exhibit anti, uh, significant antihyperglycemic uh, property. So the interesting part here, usually the investigations will be conducted on the fruits, but uh, these particular studies have actually focused on the leaves because, and uh, interestingly, it has shown equal uh, good antioxidant, pro uh, anti antioxidant as well as antidiabetic property. And this has triggered an interest in us to explore the potential effect of uh, the leaves uh, obtained from the plant called Cisigem malasensei because it was uh, less explored at the point of time when the project was begin. So uh, just to give an intro on this uh, plant, it is commonly found in Malaysian apple and it's locally known as Malay apple. Traditionally, it has been used to treat uh, diabetes uh, in Brazil, but at that time, the scientific evidences was uh, minimal. And slowly, uh, the fruit extract and other parts of the plant has been shown to be able to prevent the development of hyperglycemia induced cataractogenesis and improve the fasting blood sugar level in diabetic plants. So with that, um, we have actually taken this uh, input and proceeded to actually investigate uh, the anti-diabetic effect of the ethanolic leaf extract of Cisigia malassensi. So the leaf extract has been subjected to bioassay-guided fractionation using refractory HPLC system. And out of the uh, number of fractions obtained, the fraction two showed very uh, potent antioxidant and antiglycemic properties. 
So we isolated this fraction and subjected to LCMS analysis to identify the bioactive components. Interestingly, the fraction was rich with myricetin derivatives as stated here, particularly the myricetin, which was present at the uh, highest percentage of volume, about 77%. And this data was then uh, further validated using LCMS coupled to triple quad LCMS uh, spec mass spectrometer. And uh, we proceeded with further uh, pharma, um, biological effect uh, investigations. Uh, in the basic screening, of course, uh, the virus setting derivative showed a very good radical scavenging property and antioxidant power. It has inhibited uh, the alpha amylase and alpha glucosidase enzymes, which are actually the carbohydrate hydrolyzing enzymes. So the idea here is it works uh, uh, when it actually inhibits this enzyme, it prevents the further digestion of carbohydrate to glucose, which can contribute to increased amount of glucose in the blood. Besides, we have also uh, investigated the anti glycation property of uh, the derivatives, in which uh, the derivatives were able to in, uh, exhibit a moderate inhibition of advanced glycation end product. Advanced glycation end products actually forms uh, due to, uh, as a consequence of high blood glucose level, and it can actually cause damage. Uh, of uh, various macromolecules, let it be DNA, lipids, and proteins, and can cause the development uh, towards the development of various chronic diseases, include, including diabetes and diabetic-related complications. So the anti-glycation um, activity of myricetin derivatives uh, appears to be favorable in uh, as a therapeutic target uh, to actually prevent the formation of advanced glycation product and believed to be favorable in prevent the development of the chronic diseases. So uh, we have proceeded with the in vitro study in which we use two different models. One is the adipocytes to assess insulin-like activity of the myricetin derivatives and uh, the retinal cells to mimic the diabetic retinopathy condition uh, in which we have investigated the protective effect assessment. Um, we, have, uh, we have proceeded with the protective effect assessment of the derivatives uh, against oxidative stress, which was induced using two uh, factors, which are high glucose, and glucose oxidase to induce an acute oxidative stress condition because uh, the enzyme could actually catalyze the production of hydrogen peroxide. So in the adipocyte model, so just to give a, a note, insulin uh, enhances the glucose uptake from blood into the cells by the activation of insulin signaling pathway. So we actually tried to investigate uh, the effect of myricetin derivatives on adipocytes in the absence of uh, insulin to see whether it ex exhibits uh, insulin-like activity. So our finding shows that uh, the myricetin derivatives actually enhanced glucose uptake into the cells via the insulin signaling pathway in which it activated genes similarly to what insulin has done. And uh, in addition, it has also activated the adiponectin AMPK cascade, which also um, results in the uh, final glucose uptake into the cell. So upon uh, once the glucose enters, there was uh, we observed as an increase in the lipid accumulation, or known as adipogenesis, similarly to insulin. And there were factors uh, that contributes to the adipogenesis was also upregulated, similar to insulin. So various uh, stress-related factors were downregulated, which suggested uh, the ability of the derivatives to reduce oxidative stress in the cells. So proceeding to the retinal cell model in which we induce oxidative stress using high glucose. So to start off, high, in the presence of high glucose, there was uh, we observed that there's an increase in reactive oxygen species and age production extracellularly as well as intracellularly. Besides, the NRF2 pathway was deactivated in the presence of high glucose. NRF2 pathway is responsible to uh, activate antioxidant defense mechanism in the cells to protect retinal cells. However, it was downregulated in the presence of high glucose. And many protective factors, including antioxidant enzymes, were downregulated. And there was upregulation of uh, advanced glycation product uh, receptor. Uh, on contra in contrast, in the presence of myricetin derivatives, all these were reversed, in which uh, the level of ROS and H extracellularly and intracellularly were reduced. There was an activation of NRF2 pathway, in, uh, which suggested overall uh, activation of antioxidant defense system in the retinal cells. And it was confirmed by the activation of an, uh, antioxidant enzymes, such as the glutathione peroxidase and catalase and other uh, protective factors. 
and uh, there was a down regulation of age uh, related uh, receptor. So overall, um, it was summarized to say that myricetin derivatives protected the retinal cells against ox oxidative stress induced by high glucose. We have uh, also attempted to induce acute oxidative stress using glucose oxidase in which the enzyme used, uh, uses glucose as a substrate to produce the hydrogen peroxide. So in the presence of myricetin derivatives, uh, there was a reduction in hydrogen peroxide level observed extracellularly. Uh, it can be speculated that the derivatives would have directly scavenged the hydrogen peroxide or inhibited the enzyme to stop the conversion of uh, glucose into hydrogen peroxide. In the case that hydrogen peroxide has escaped into the cells to form uh, hydroxyl radicals, uh, we noticed that the uh, myricetin derivatives have also prevented the uh, increase in reactive oxygen species through the activation of antioxidant defense system in the cells uh, through NRF2 pathway and to, to, through the activation of antioxidant enzymes such as superoxide, superoxide dismutase and down regulation of uh, inflammatory factors. And again, under this model, it has shown uh, it has protected the cells against oxidative stress, suggesting the potential uh, protective effect of these derivatives against diabetic retinopathy, uh, which was uh, proven through in vitro study. We then actually proceeded um, uh, after I have completed my project. So the project was pursued by another PhD candidate uh, in which uh, the candidate has investigated my against derivatives defects in in vivo model. So the derivatives was uh, found to be safe for oral consumption up to 1,500 milligrams per kg. And then uh, the protective effect of the derivatives uh, against high fat diet induced obesity, glucose intolerance and oxidative stress in mice was investigated. And uh, the findings were published in uh, two different articles. So to summarize, the derivatives at uh, 50 milligram per kg was found to be most effective in which it has significantly reduced weight gain in the mice due to the high fat diet. It has reduced glucose intolerance, occurrence of insulin resistance, lipid accumulation in liver and kidney, dyslipidemia and oxidative stress. On the positive side, it has increased the thermogenesis process, which could answer uh, the reason why uh, the mice has actually has a loss in um, weight gain. Besides, it has improved the serum lipid profile and improved uh, the metabolic status. And this was uh, observed based on its, uh, the positive impact of myricetin derivatives on the gut microbiota. Just to give a note on this, um, Usually in, uh, in obese and diabetic individuals, certain population of the microbiota uh, will be reduced and uh, that which could lead to inflammation and uh, affects the metabolic status. However, in the presence of myricetin derivatives in this model, we observed that the acromancia population uh, in the gut of the mice was increased, suggesting uh, its positive impact to reduce inflammation as well as uh, its positive impact in uh, enhancing the energy expenditure, which explains the improvement in metabolic status. So altogether, the findings showed potential beneficial effect of uh, the myricetin derivatives in the prevention and management of obesity and associated metabolic disorders, hypoglycemia and oxidative stress. So in summary, the derivatives from myricetin derivatives from Cisigen mala sensitive extract showed potential uh, Potentials to be developed as an adjuvant, the functional food for the treatment of hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, and oxidative stress complications, which uh, we predict should be uh, useful for the management of diabetes and related complications. So, um, the, uh, we, will, we wanted to actually address some challenges pertaining to uh, the nutraceutical application of the myricetin derivatives. So, one of the major challenges about flavonoids is uh, they have poor, poor eco-solubility and low stability, which limits their nutri uh, formulation applications and nutraceutical applications. So uh, there are many technologies have been introduced in order to overcome the limitations, which includes nanotechnology as well as uh, en uh, encapsulation. However, these uh, methods involve very complicated protocols and could be very expensive to be conducted. So to overcome uh, that factors, uh, recently, uh, Another form of delivery system has been uh, discovered and being actively investigated, known as the co-amorphous delivery system, in which the drug of interest was uh, put into together along with excipients 
which are could be a low molecular weight uh, compounds or other drug molecules which will form a complex. So when we actually uh, subject this complex into an aqueous uh, condition, the drugs will be released and uh, the drugs can actually perform its pharmacological effect as usual. So the advantages of this uh, co-amorphous delivery system includes it could uh, enhance the solubility of the drugs which has poor aqueous solubility issues improve stability, improve bioavailability, and this can be achieved easily through a simpler complex preparation technique compared to nano uh, delivery as well as encapsulation methods. Besides, we can also achieve combination therapy because the XCP molecules could also exhibit uh, its own pharmacological effect, and this could be achieved by the formation of the complex between the drug and the XCP molecules. One such example is uh, simvastatin, which has a poor, it's a lip, uh, lipid lowering drug, which has a poor aqueous stability, has been uh, put it together with an amino acid known as arginine. So it, uh, the formation of complex was uh, initiated with a very simple protocol. And upon uh, subjecting that into an aqueous system, it was found that the simvastatin could actually dissociate and perform its pharmacological effect as usual. So this is very useful for pharmaceutical uh, application to expand the pharmaceutical application of the drug. So having this in mind, we have attempted to form flavonoid amino acid complex using this co-amorphous uh, formulation system. And we are starting off with the project with quercetin, which is also a famous flavonoid uh, known for its various pharmacological effects. So our aim here to see whether the complex formation could uh, enhance the solubility, equal solubility of quercetin and its stability in the system, in which at the same time, it could maintain the pharmacological effect of the quercetin. If this is successful, we will navigate the research to uh, form complex using the myricetin derivatives with the amino acid, uh, with the hope that it could uh, lead to a positive results in which uh, it will be favorable for formulation purposes uh, for example, uh, we know that, uh, as mentioned earlier, myricetin derivatives are favorable for uh, in diabetic retinopathy model. So it can be potentially considered to form ocular uh, formulations, ocular therapeutic formulation using this concept. So this will expand the nutraceutical applications of the flavonoids. So with that, uh, these are the references used for this presentation. I would like to thank uh, the experts, the collaborators of the project. In fact, they are my ex-supervisors, uh, Professor Umarani Kupusami, Professor Chua Kekeng, and Professor Uma Devi Palanisami. Research grants that have supported financially the uh, different projects and members who have uh, directly and indirectly contributed in the different projects. So just to give a quick note on the research focus in biochemistry laboratory, the Department of Biomedical Science, our research focus revolves around free radical biochemistry, natural products, and protein stability. At the moment, um, we are actually targeting on diabetes and obesity to come up with alternate treatments. And we also do cover other related diseases. So these are my collaborators again, and uh, these are my contact details. I would like to welcome more collaborations uh, from this webinar. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and thank you to the organizer for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bhavani, for an excellent lecture on this uh, myricetin that is a potential agent to be incorporated as part of an alternative measure to manage diabetes. Um, there are questions in the question and answer, but I'll start off with one question first. On a very personal note, I do realize because I grow mulberry as well, and I have used the mulberry leaves as part of um, a tea concoction. When I first ingested that, I kind of felt off. I decided to Google and to find out why I was behaving like that. And I realized the leaves of the mulberry has also got anti-diabetic. That means it is a hypoglycemic agent. So on that note, I have since avoided it because I'm not diabetic and I don't intend to bring my blood sugar down and cause me to feel uneasy. The question now is, how do you advise the public now that they are hearing your lecture, which is very interesting, who is probably going to go on a beach of all these uh, agents that you have named? And how would you advise them how much to take in order to normalize their blood sugar, because quantifying the amount of, you know, maybe um, 
the uh, various agents that you have identified is not going to be easy. I, you know, just with the mulberry leaf, I just took three leaves, make tea out of it, and it was enough to cause me to become a little bit blur. Okay, thank you for the question, uh, Prof. So definitely, it's, it's definitely a very good question because uh, natural product, uh, this is one of the challenges here because determining the right dosage because uh, it, it is not just the flavonoids. There are many other plant bioactive compounds. So when you actually, um, you know, boil it to get the extract and drink it, so you will be actually having different components that, uh, that are present in the uh, leaves. And some can be very potent. Example, as I said, the cesium community, it can be very potent to the extent that uh, it can cause hypoglycemic effect. So um, ideally, uh, when we are actually on medication, uh, like this is how the common advice is like uh, when you're in medication, generally on diabetic medication, and you are actually taking natural products alongside, you have to be careful about the dosage as well, because it can do a synergistic effect causing further decrease in the diabetic level. So it has to be either one, of course, but uh, the main uh, advice is like patients should be on diabetic medication as uh, recommended. Uh, the natural product on portions can be taken in a moderate way. Okay, uh, probably it's not in a like on daily basis. Uh, rather, it should have some gaps and uh, one should be very vigilant about uh, the effects because it, it, it is very subject to individual basis. Some could tolerate and some could not. So... Uh, Sometimes uh, that's the reason like we should not actually take advice from anyone to say a, take a particular dosage directly. Many things has to be consulted. So there are many centers, proper Ayurvedic centers that they can actually give you, uh, they will take into consideration what is your existing medications and then they will accordingly, they will say how much you should drink per day, how much you should take uh, or how many days or whether is it on alternate day basis and etc. cetera. And uh, sometimes... Uh, on, in, in another way, it can be done is like uh, we can also, because there's, there's a, there are also attempts to produce all these uh, natural products as functional food and it can be used in a fortified form, which will be a little bit more safer because when you consume it with the food, the effect may not be that significant or prominent compared to you take it as an extract. So these are the precautions that one should take when they consider a natural product as an alternate treatment. Good. So all those um, audience of ours, please be mindful. Yeah. You, you may have to get it uh, done under kind of supervision. Don't overeat all this stuff and find that you become hypoglycemic. All right. Prof. Sarah was actually asking you whether it is uh, Jambu IA that you are referring to as one of the list of products. Uh, no, Jambu IA is Cisigium apple. It's a different plant. This is actually the Malay apple, Jambu Mera. So it's, it's oh. a different form. They're closely related. Actually, the, they just differ by the, the leaves, how they look like, the fruits. Definitely the fruits, they differ a lot. The okay. fruits of this plant is slightly bigger compared to Jambu Ai, right. which is a different plant, different species. She was also wondering about the relationship between thermogenesis and weight gain. Uh, maybe yeah. I, can, I can actually answer the question if, sure, uh, if sure. it's not related to your research. Anyway, a lot of us have got very high metabolism, you know, and um, those of us with high metabolism, almost thyrotoxic kind of person, you are not likely to gain weight. So there is actually a close relation between not using up the energy that you have inside you and storing it and storing it and becoming um, obese as a result of the storage of energy sources in you, in the form of fat, in the form of... Um, um, whatever energy sources inside you and you have it as obesity as well and even your blood sugars get elevated as a result so um, when you give insulin it's like it increases um, the metabolism in the cells as well and this will use up the uh, energy in the conversion to ATPs and all that and then you would get um, too much storage and too much obesity in the scene I believe um, Dr. Bhavani has to leave. If there are any more questions inside this uh, Q&A box, we will definitely send it to you and you can connect with the person who's asked the question. Thank you for a brilliant talk. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you, thank very, you much. very much, Prof. And thank you very much to the organizer and uh, um, attendees of this Amida. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, we will now move on to our next physiologically focused from the Department of Physiology. 
and that would be from Dr. Mazia, who is actually um, going to talk to us about esports, ever gaming as a way of improving health amidst those involved in um, lockdown where they can't move very much out of their comfort zone, as well as um, where the uh, increasing uh, uh, framework of digital world is uh, now part of our lifestyle. Um, I'm actually wondering about this word, ever gaming. It's very new to me, but I'm very sure in the course of her presentation, she will make it clear what exactly this new concept is all about. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Mazia. Thank you, Prof Chan. I'll just um, share my screen, my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Can everyone see my presentation clearly? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So, um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Mazia from the Department of Physiology. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are interested to know on what is actually esports as a gaming and how is it related to improving health alongside the global digital expansion that we're experiencing right now as, as, as well as the pandemic related lockdowns. So uh, we'll just brief on a little bit on it. So exogaming is actually a type of video game that requires active bodily movements for in-game control. Now, um, if most of you, some of, um, most of you, if not all, are familiar with the type of esports gaming. Uh, as you can see on the top, can you see on the top uh, right corner here? This is the usual esports esports uh, e that we are familiar with, where the players just sit in the chair and face their monitors, and then they play using um, the mouse pads, and also it, they don't move that much. So it's something of a sedentary type of esports but for exit gaming it's more of a motion type of sports that re replicates conventional sports for instance if you're playing tennis or if you're playing boxing as you can see on the uh, lower right side of the picture here you actually have to stand and move about so if you're playing boxing you really have to use your arms and also your trunk and also your legs to actually move and play against the CPU or the other opponent. And it is played either using a motion sensor or camera detected controller. So if you can see here, the player is actually holding a move motion controller, which is detected by the camera for uh, in-game control movements detection. So actually why I decided to introduce Exagaming is because currently the uh, American College of Sports Medicine, the World Health Organizations, the uh, Australian Exercise Group, all recommended at least everyone within the age of 18 to 65 years old to perform a moderate intensity exercise um, at least 150 minutes per week. Um, it's just divided into two to three weeks per week or vigorous intensity at 75 minutes per week, which is divided into two to three times a week at minimum of 10 minutes per session. Also, you have to have a little bit of strength training, like repetitions of your uh, muscle movements and also your joint motion flexibility, but they do not have any specifics on these training. What they do impose on is the moderate and the vigorous intensity exercise, which should be done weekly. And for children between 6 to 17 years old, they have to perform at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise daily. And unfortunately, for the Malaysian population, only about 7 to 15 percent, depending on the population you're studying, actually achieve this recommendation. And this does not include the step count. So for metabolic performance and health improvements, um, the step count actually doesn't count. And it doesn't really affect your how your cardiac performance and your metabolic improvements uh, is actually improved. So in order for you to do that, you have to have the aerobic exercise, which is either in moderate intensity or vigorous intensity. And uh, when we studied about some of the barriers to exercise, which is especially during the pandemic, since um, even though we do not have the national lockdowns anymore, some of us are still concerned about, you know, um, having sports in a, in a team manner. And then when you have to crowd around just to perform your daily, your weekly, your daily dose of exercise. So some of those, are, some of them are still concerned about that. And some of these themes are div divided into four central 
uh, issues, which is physical limitations, like they don't have a space for exercise, they don't have the equipment at home, and then you also have issues like gyms and training centers closed or no outdoor activities allowed. This is during the pandemic. And also you have a personal characteristics like people, they're not motivated to exercise when it's done alone. They need to have someone with them. They need to play sports. Like if you're playing soccer, they need to have their friends along. Or some of them actually need their trainer or coach to, you know, boost them up to you to do the um, amount of moderate or vigorous intensity exercise they have to do. Also during the MCO related mandates and the prolonged national lockdowns have also affected the uh, uh, participation to exercise but to note that even before the the pandemic actually one of the most important and significant finding that we found is that transportation was always significantly associated with uh, non-participation to moderate and vigorous exercise so another key important thing is that um, there's also a pay gap among female and male athletes. You can see that the male professional players usually receive between 15 to 1,000% more in salaries and prize monies than females. So if you host an um, event, a sports competition event, uh, most likely it's only for males or the price for males is way, way, way higher than it is for females. And one of the main reasons is because of it attracts more spectators for to have uh, male sports athletes. And this is also inclusive of esports. And because of more spectators, uh, the, um, the companies that are willing to join and uh, promote this type of sports actually is more centered towards males and also unfortunately in Malaysia there, there, there's this lesser opportunity for females to earn equal pay because of physiological um, limitations perceptive like you have this perception that you know boxing is not for females and then you have the religious boundaries of covering up when you're playing sports and then there's also this segregation of masculine versus feminine type of sports like I've mentioned before netball is always for females boxing is always synonymous with um, males so this is we I couldn't find any uh, data on in Malaysia between female and male uh, athletes, but uh, even though um, US is considered a very uh, developed country, you can see that the gap, the pay gap between male and female athletes is way way higher. Especially if you can see in basketball, golf, soccer, softball, and um, what's interesting is that tennis doesn't have that much of a uh, pay gap between males and females uh, and this is thanks to Billie Jean King and if you want to know more about this notion from Billie Jean King which uh, he wants to have equal pay in tennis players you can watch the movie Battle of the Sexes. So my program is actually to promote esports exit gaming and the primary objectives are to improve to to assess the effects of the um, health outcomes in terms of physical activity levels, their cardiac performance, uh, their resting heart rate, and BMI. So resting heart rate is um, an indicator of your health level, and also the VO2 max is an indicator, the gold standard for your uh, fitness level. And also we want to collect players' experience and perceptions on exit gaming as a new modality of exercise. Now, if, I, if you rem remember from my previous uh, prep, slides that I've mentioned transportation is one of the main issues as to why barriers uh, to exercise is predominant among the population in Malaysia. So to do that, I actually um, got these equipments which cost around 1,800 uh, in total to procure each set and I actually asked them to play in a program center based and um, the most important thing is that I'm trying to promote equality. So that means males and females are not segregated against um, you know, different populations. And also wheelchair users can play with able-bodied people. So you can see from this uh, picture. Hold on, I'm just going to try and play one of the videos. So you can see that uh, the able-bodied person can actually play against the person on, in the wheelchair together in a game. And you'll never see this in conventional or traditional sports. Here you can see that a female is actually um, fighting against a male opponent in a boxing competition, which is something you, can, you also will never see. And here in cooperative team play, you can see that a person in a wheelchair is actually playing volleyball uh, with someone who is able-bodied. So this is something that uh, actually reduces the gap between those with and without physical limitations and 
females and males. And for the training, I actually also asked them to perform the training at home. So you can see they're playing at home, they have their own TV and the set. So what they noted that uh, this is something th that is very beneficial for them, especially during the MC MCO lockdowns. So you can see them playing in their living rooms and their bedrooms. So it's something positive for them. And also, I also have some of the other players. So in total, I have around, I think, 15 or 14. So they can also play in centers, in, uh, in a health center or in schools. So here we can, you can see that uh, some of them, some of the kids are actually training at school and in, in a health facility. But most of the adults, they opted for home-based. And uh, we'll discuss about why they preferred that modality. So some of the findings that I found that their yeah, physical activity level actually increased by more than five times. Some, some, some of them actually have eight times more increase in physical activity level and their respiratory capacity which is the indicator vo2 max which is the indicator of fitness level actually increased by two to three five four and uh, high relatively high enjoyment and you can see that it's significantly more than conventional counterparts because we did uh, we did we did a paper on comparing conventional versus esports game exogaming in terms of enjoyment and then in general, the exergaming actually produced moderate to vigorous intensity, which is what we're looking at. So the RP is more than three, the heart rate max is usually more than 75% of their maximum. And then the, met the metabolic intensity is usually four to six. And the training time that they, has, they spent at home versus um, in the center is actually three to four times more. And one of the reasons is because they are motivated to, to play against the CPU because the CPU doesn't tire out. It's just between them. So if you play with someone, that person might tire out and say, okay, that's cool. we don't want to play anymore. So the, 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 the training time actually reduces. And also they, they say that the exiting console is actually easy to set up and is space efficient. I have one of my participants who stays in a 30 square feet apartment. Uh, sorry, I call it Soho. It's a small apartment and it, it actually can fit all of her tennis and also boxing exit games. Uh, so it, it can use, you can use the TV for, she can, she said she can use the TV for her um, working because she's working at home and also she can use it for entertainment when she doesn't want to use it for esports. And then she can also use it as a, an exercise equipment. So she said it's a, you can save a lot more space than buying a treadmill or an indoor bicycle. And then there's also a lapse of time. So sometimes they feel when they're fighting against the CPU or against someone else, they don't feel like it's exercising at all. And sometimes when they feel like if, if it's a real sport, they think, oh, 30 minutes, I'm already tired. But for esports as gaming, they can go on like two to three hours just straight. And they enjoy playing with someone rather than exercising and doing. Uh, this is especially for during the pandemic. So the limitations is um, we have the home base and we also have the center-based issues. Some of the center-based issues are mostly personal characteristics like, like too old, no transport, no time, clash with other activities and whatnot. But the limitations that I see in the home base is that uh, just that family members actually have to take turns when using the TV for education because they are you know, studying at home as well. And then sometimes we have equipment breaking down halfway through the training program. That's very stressful for me. And some of them do not have any TV sets available. So we have to provide that for them. So these are my published works for this program. Uh, quite a lot. I've started it since 2018, actually. So um, before that, it was just a small scale uh, project. So actually, the, the we join it with the sustainable development goals of 2030. So to, it's to reach out to more people and reduce inequalities, to promote good health and well-being, and to promote awareness. Um, and improve the industry innovation and infrastructure for its existence in exergaming and improve, uh, let them know about this benefits of exergaming so that it can be promoted in a national competition. So far, esports as a gaming is not part of the uh, Olympic sports and neither is it a part of all the national level uh, sports events like Sukma or ASEAN. Mm. So that's sad. So we're trying to actually change that in the future. Hopefully we can do that. So in the future that I wish that industry actually design more games or that existing, more existing games to promote esports type of uh, 
exegaming and also to promote more exegaming at home because you know right, right now the pandemic is still there you still have the COVID-19 it's not um, from, it's not something that you should ignore uh, it's coming and then I want to promote esports exegaming for Olympics that's my like ultimate goal and also for uh, personal characteristics like cultivating fun in exercise and improving physical activity levels and also engaging them to promote and motivate adher exercise adherence even at home. So these are some of the pictures of the tournament leagues, the winners that we're having. Uh, and we also have the online-based esports exegaming competition that we hosted. Now it's ongoing August to December 2021. So that's all. These are all my participants. All right, thank you. That's most interesting, Dr. Masia. I'm just suddenly aware that there's such an entity called Ever Gaming. All right, <laughs> I shall introduce to all the TV, I mean the computer addicts in my family as a first step towards getting a bit of exercise in them. Now, Dr. Kong, who is from the faculty, wants to know whether there are any... Um, free arrangements in your department so that he can join your department, either probably as part of your research group participant or just to make sure he gets enough exercise through this means. Okay, so uh, currently we do not offer free usage for staff and students, but we did post out a poster to all UM staff and students, so to anyone who's interested to participate in our online uh, esports exegaming. And I think only two or three from the students, the UM students actually um, registered for this. And we sent them the, our PS3, the, the, the equipment for them to use it at home. So because of the online tournament that we are hosting currently, we do not have any for free usage, probably in the future. Yeah. All right. Um, actually, um, do you have different, different options? Because uh, Prof. Sarah also wants to know whether it's just limited to tennis and uh, what's the other game um, that she was kind of mentioning? Tennis? Uh, and yeah. Well so boxing. currently we have quite a number of exit games. Uh, we've studied about five types, which is uh, tennis, bowling, boxing, gladiator duel, um, sorry, six, beach volleyball, and also tennis, boxing, bowling, beach volleyball, gladiator duel. Yeah, so five, sorry, five. So it's tennis, boxing, gladiator duel, beach volleyball, and bowling. So currently we have five. But the tournaments that are more, most popular are the tennis and boxing. So it's not really standstill. So we can see that the wheelchair users actually have to move around, especially if they have to move forward or backwards. And sometimes they have the trigger command in the move controllers to actually move the avatar without moving their wheelchair. So they can do that. Yeah. So it's actually very interesting. It's limited in that uh under these kind of circumstances, just to the use of the upper limb then, what if uh, patients, if you are actually going to subject this to patient use in future, um, what if they have weakness in the lower limbs but can still move and you would like this um, ever game strategy to develop more muscles in the lower limbs? Would, do you think um, more, more, more options of ever gaming focusing on the lower limbs should come into existence? Yes, but unfortunately, I'm not doing that kind of study, but there is a possibility of um, connecting the exergame to a bicycle, indoor bicycle, where they can train their, their, their lower limbs uh, for rehabilitation. This is especially for those with uh, lower limb weakness, uh, muscle weakness, or spinal cord injury is also possible. There's also a uh, body weight tread, treadmill training, what we call it, which is we connect the uh, exergame to a jogging or running type of sports and then connect it to the body weight treadmill training so that the person with the SCI can actually perform the running. And also it can be seen as a, a training for rehabilitation of the lower limbs. So it's possible, but I personally have not done it. All right, that's fabulous. So maybe um, besides the physiology department, which is using it as part of research, maybe we should ask Prof. Sarah and her team in orthopedics um, whether they have already ventured there as well or has um, kind of plans to venture into this. Are you all uh, working in collaboration with other departments, especially rehab medicine? 
to look into this? Mm, I think it's possible. I think the main issue now is just grant funding, not just grant mm -hmm. funding. We have grants, but we cannot purchase the PS3 consoles, the Exagame consoles, because there's always issue with equipment purchase. And right. yeah, so because of that, we either have to either rent it or we have to, you know, people who are willingly good enough to actually donate the sum. So that's how we got away, how we, you know, got along with this program. And I think the main issue is not just funding, it's just like the procurement of the consoles. And most of the time, people from higher ups, they don't understand what we're doing. They just say, mm -hmm. oh, equipment, no. Oh, home base, no. So everything is no, no, no. So it's a, it's a downer. Mm. All right. Very interesting. So this, um, uh, what shall we say? This game plans or ever game plans um, in terms of purchase of the program itself is quite expensive? Um. The program is it's not really expensive. As I mentioned before, one set actually costs around 1800 to procure. But oh. because it is, um, it is put under equipment, it cannot be put oh. under consumables. So it becomes an issue because very rarely grants actually offer purchasing of equipments. And even if it is purchased in equipments, you can't move it about. You can't place it in their homes or you can't place it in centres. That I mean, I have centres um, which I collaborate with from all over Malaysia. But we have the issue of, you know, sending it to to, to those centres in Trangano, like Kedah and Penang and all that because of the equipment issue. So that's the major limitation in my programme. So that means one programme at 1,800 will give you the programme and just enough equipment for one player. So if you want um, more players to be involved with the uh, tennis game or whatever, you have to have additional funds as well for the purchase of this tennis. Uh... No, no, no. What I meant was that it, let's just say they gave uh, 20,000 for to run this program. So, right. so, so when you, they gave the 20,000 to run this program, the divisions are all on consumables or uh, let's just say GRA allocation, salary allocation. The vote is not given for equipment, which is the main thing that is required in this exagame home based exagaming program. So that is the main issue right now. Oh uh, do you understand? The vote under the equipment that is not given in the grant. So okay. how are you supposed to run the program if you can't buy the PS3 console, which is allocated under the uh, equipment vote allocation? I understand your problem, but yeah. I think you may have not understood my question. Uh -huh. Let's say if I want to organize a charity or donation to get the equipment, does the 1,800 just give you one set of that console plus the game option plan plus equipment just for one person to be doing the tennis play or and, and you have to have additional costs put in for the purchase of more tennis sets to play with this um, program. Oh, okay, okay. So it's definitely not enough. You need to, one program needs at least three, three sets. And that 1,800 does not include the TV, which is also a requirement. So what we usually do is we either borrow somebody else's TV uh, and it's usually around 32 inches or more. Because anything smaller than that, then there will be issues with the camera sensors reading your movements. You need a bigger tennis, uh, sorry, a, a bigger TV set. And you, usually, if one set, you can actually play with two people. And if it's a group, you can actually play with four, but they have to take turns. Like it's a tag team. Oh, it's man. possible. Yeah. Interesting as well. Is there a generational gap in the sense that? Uh, do you find that uh, most of the uh, people who are actually into this ever gaming or ex sorry, exercise gaming are actually more likely to come from the younger generation because um, the older generation, people like me, will be a little bit adverse to uh, this kind of activity? Actually, it's quite the opposite. We have our players, the expert players. We have the beginner, the intermediate, and the expert players. So the beginner mostly consists of uh, children, so around 6 to 17. Then we have the intermediate. intermediate. That one is from all stages of life. But the experts are more of the adult, older adult, around 35 and above, 35 to 50. That's the expert players. So these expert players are often of the older age group. 
And so, how long does it take to become an expert? Ah, so a minimum of three months, which is 12 weeks of training, then you can get to the expert level. Wow, not too so long. Most, most, yeah. most of my expert level players are all within that age group, 35 and above. All right. Prof. Sarah was wondering whether um, there are we can have a, a bit of a donation drive, asking me whether I'm interested to donate my TV screen. Not yet. I still need my TV screen to watch the news. But would, would you accept old TV screens, um, especially when we upgrade? Oh, of course we do. As long as the TV has the HDMI port. Because some old TVs, they don't have an, a HDMI port. So as long as you have that, then we can, you know, we usually accept that. Um, and we can, because my, the main issue with uh, my program is that it's not conducted in a center base, like it's not in Department of Physiology, it's at home, because they are doing it at home, they are training at home. Mm. So are you willing to give that old TV to somebody at home to train? Yeah. All right. But if you, I suppose if you list down all the participants and can account for it, it doesn't matter where, as long as they are participating in this exercise part of donation. You have to trust the um, recipient of your donation that they're doing good work with it. Prof yes. Lam was wondering um, whether you are at the present moment looking at um, more physiological focused outcome in, in the form of whether it improves the VMAX and um, whether they actually improve the uh, strength. I believe the muscle strength of your population um, uh, that is understudy. Okay, so the structure and intensity, if I already mentioned in one of the slides, it's at least moderate um, intensity, about 150 minutes per week with the additional muscle strength and uh, straight training, which they can just do by lifting dumbbells in their major muscle limb, uh, sorry, major upper limbs mm -hmm. or lower limbs. And also they can also perform it vigorous uh, intensity uh, at 75 minutes per week. So those are the main structure. Uh, and then they calculated whether they it's uh, it's they performed it in moderate or vigorous intensity using I there's a lot of scales that you can find out there. There's a Borg scale, there's a para SCI scale, um, there's also the intensity of heart rate max. So usually they have a watch there so they can see um, their heart rate elevating from their either resting heart level or their expected uh, maximum heart rate. So they can monitor that through that. Usually they do more than, than what is required. When, when it's required only 75 minutes, they'll do like, I think 350 minutes per week. Because, wow. because when they play, they don't realize that they're playing. Because, you know, when you're, 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 opponent, uh, you're, you're opposing the CPU, they get frustrated when they lose. So they want to try again, again, and again, again, until they win. So they'll stop. So there's a score, there's a score there as well that is kind of registered on the TV screen as to yes. what your response has been like. So they yes. challenge you all the time. Yes. So wow. so so they are fighting against each other also for the highest score. So uh, yeah, the competition is based on that. Interesting. Have you all registered any addiction in this? Ah, so addiction has not been um, registered for this because they can stop when they're tired. But I'm not sure about the normal conventional esports. Conventional esports when it comes to you know the one that's sitting, that one I'm not sure because that's mine, not my area. For exergaming, no, because when you're tired, you have to stop because it has to move around. And wrist flicking and all those cheat codes are not applicable here. You can't do that without uh, with the esports exergaming. It's impossible. And uh, the other thing is that I think uh, most, most scientists actually confuse addiction with engagement. So there's a study that I've quoted in one of my papers saying that when you play exit games, there's this, um, this selection or this ignition of one, some parts of the brain, which is always confused with addiction. But actually, it's engagement and focus and also motivation. So it's called mesocortical limbo track, I think. I don't know. I can't remember the exact um, place in the brain so maybe maybe those who are computer addicts should be introduced to this exercise gaming since you can't become too addicted to it you are limited by the exercise itself and of course you have the advantage of exercise i shall tell all my computer addict um, relatives or friends to probably look into this as a means of getting out of that dungeon 
interesting. You've just opened a, 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 a you know, a, a very eye-opening uh, experience for myself. And I'm sure the rest of the audience feels the same as well. I don't think there are any more questions, but if there are, since it's nine o'clock already, if there are, we will get the team to send it to you. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Masia, for an excellent uh, presentation. And who says physiology is not interesting? In my mind, it is very interesting, especially if you can translate it into clinical medicine. Now, as the chair, I would like to uh, end, but before I do, I am going to share with you that um, the research eCarnival 2021 is ongoing. It will start, um, I mean, it has already started on Monday. Today is the third day. It will start again at 9.30. And this consists of a series of lectures, very interesting ones as well, I can assure you, and from very interesting people as well. And it will still be ongoing till tomorrow. So I would like, or I would advocate that all of you go and um, try to attend um, that through the link from the uh, Faculty of Medicine's uh, YouTube website, or um, there has been messages sent out or emails sent out. So try to get there if you're able to and try to benefit from this research e-carnival. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the, both the speakers for a very enlightening uh, session, as well as you, the audience, for sharing those questions and making the whole event so interesting. Thank you very much.